on in our study, the um, when we get to Exodus 25 through 40, that is chapters 25 through 40, that is the, those chapters cover the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? Also, it's called the uh, sanctuary. And um, we find that the tabernacle or the sanctuary was ordained by God as the place for the Israelites to meet with him, to receive his teaching, his revelation, and to worship corporately as a redeemed people, ideally a nation of priests to Yahweh. So the tabernacle, accordingly, was the localization of God's presence with his people, a visible symbol that he was their God. And it was there at the tabernacle or the sanctuary that Israel was to worship and atone for breaches, violations of the covenant stipulations. But again, symbols in the Old Testament were preparatory for something superior. And thus, in the case of the tabernacle, it pointed forward to a time when God would fully dwell with his people again in the person of his son. If you'll turn with me uh, to John chapter 1 and verse 14, let me point out something that is very important here. John chapter 1 and verse 14, John tells us that the Word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh. So he took upon himself flesh without ceasing to be God. We know that because in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Greek word was, is a continuous, timeless existence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and speaking of God the Father, and the Word was God. The Greek word was, again, continuous, timeless existence. He was in the beginning with God, verse 2. All things came into being through Him. So, uh, again, as He has to be Creator, because he is creating. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life. The Greek word again, was, is continuous, timeless existence, and the life was the light of men. And then John, so John is clearly teaching at the outset of the of his gospel the deity of Jesus and then in verse 14 he begins to introduce the humanity of Jesus and the word became one time the greek word became is is in the past tense one time uh, of course in the incarnation the word became flesh and dwelt among us that Greek word dwell is the word tabernacle. Jesus is our tabernacle, if you will. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. The Greek word is the only unique one, full of grace and truth. What an extraordinary thing John 1 is. Now, uh, so... Jesus tabernacled among us. God required, God called Moses and Bezalel and, and all the men that, that constructed the tabernacle and the, or the sanctuary uh, to make a place where he could come and meet with them. But in Jesus, God draws us to himself and, and, and in Jesus, we find the presence of God. He tabernacles with us. What an amazing thing. So in Jesus, we all, every one of us, have immediate, direct access to God and without the mediation of an earthly priest. Isn't that an amazing thing? Because in the tabernacle, only the priest could go into the holy place. The regular 
people dare not go into the holy place. And then into the Holy of Holies, only the high priest could go in and then only once per year. But when Jesus was crucified and raised from the, when he was crucified, the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom, supernaturally indicating that we all have wide open access to God. Let me ask you to turn to Hebrews chapter 4 so that we can appreciate the promise and fulfillment of the Old Testament. And um, in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, we see the fulfillment of the types and the shadows of the tabernacle and then later the temple um, fulfilled through Jesus. So he says, in Hebrews 4 verse 14 therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens not not like the earthly high priest who passes through the veil Jesus passes through the veil between earth and heaven so he says therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus the Son of God let us hold fast our confession. The reason that the writer of the Hebrews is saying that is because these Jewish believers in Yeshua, in the Messiah, were being um, sorely persecuted by their non-believing um, Jewish brethren, and they were trying to pull them back into the ways of the Old Testament. They were saying, uh, that the Old Testament is superior. The writer of the Hebrews is urging these believers to continue on with the Lord, and he's showing them how the Old Testament way to God is obsolete because it's been fulfilled. And therefore, the New Covenant is superior. In the Under the Old Covenant, only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies. Under the New Covenant, we're all priests before God. And, and that's because of Jesus. So he says in verse 15, um, let us hold fast our confession, meaning let us stand firm in our confession of faith in Jesus. He is the promised Messiah. In verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin, unlike the earthly high priest. Therefore, based on that, let us draw near with confidence. The Greek word uh, is, is parousia, which means wide open access, boldness. Uh, it was used of, of people that had an audience with the king. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The Old Testament is preparatory. Through Jesus, we all have access, immediate, direct access without the mediation of an earthly priest. So here's a great example of how the new covenant is superior to the old covenant yet both have their vital place in God's plan of salvation, in God's salvation history. And friends, this is largely the message of the book of Hebrews. Jesus is superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to the angels. Jesus is superior to the high priest. Uh, the new covenant has fulfilled the old covenant, and therefore you cannot go back. You must continue to walk by faith. That's, that's the ultimate message of Hebrews 11 is to look at the Old Testament patriarchs who were justified by faith in God and not by keeping the law. So uh, again, Hebrews was written to Jewish believers in Jesus who were being intensely persecuted by their unbelieving Jewish brethren who are trying to persuade the Jewish believers in Jesus to return to the ways of the Old Covenant, to be justified by works, 
by the keeping of the law, which they were misunderstanding and misrepresenting. Now, regarding back to the tabernacle, regarding the tabernacle, Norman Geisler summarizes its earthly significance and its preparation for the deeper significance in Christ. He shows the following. There was one door, hallelujah, one door or gate to the tabernacle. Just as <laughs> now we understand, uh, especially <coughs> why Jesus says in John 10, 9, I am the way, I am the door of the sheep. Or in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Enter in through the narrow gate, for broad is the gate that leads to destruction. And many are walking that way. But narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. Jesus, over and over and over, is making the claim that he is the only way to the Father and the historical background of that, which the Jews would have understood, is there was only one entrance into the tabernacle and one exit out of the tabernacle. Isn't that wonderful? Then the brazen altar taught the necessity of a substitution for sin. The, the sinner would bring in a blameless um, uh, an animal without any defect, lay his hand on the neck of the animal to symbolize that he should be the one that has his throat slit for his own sin. But in the mercy of God, God provides a substitutionary animal, a substitutionary sacrifice, so that the man understands that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And yet they had to repeat those sacrifices over and over and over. And that was preparatory for the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, the brazen altar taught the necessity of a substitution for sin. The sacrificial animal stood in the place of the worshiper just like Jesus. Hallelujah! stood in our place on the cross and he received the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice for your sins and my sins and the sins of every single person throughout the continent of Africa, all 52 nations that ever lived in Africa, that ever will live in Africa, and all the people throughout the United States. Jesus bore our our shame and our, the penalty to us and the wrath of God that is rightly due to us he took upon himself and allows us to go free. Can you give him a shout of praise? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the Lamb of God is worthy of our worship and our devotion. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can I hear a shout of praise in your midst right now? Praise the Lord. But friends, those people throughout CI need to hear this message. They need to hear it in Kenya. They need to know that God died for them and loves them and cares for them and wants to forgive them of their sins. And only through genuine love and, and, and care and concern will they hear what we have to say. Disciple your people in this. Disciple your people in an increasing love for the lost to serve them, to bless them, to pray for them, to trust God for miracles for them so that he can show himself strong to the unsaved. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wish I was with you right now. So, so Jesus is our ultimate substitutionary sacrifice. Praise God. He made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Um, let's look at Romans chapter 3 and verses 23 through 25. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 25. Praise the Lord. Opak Ruov, Buana Sefiwe, Opaki Yesu, Bi Rojo Maler. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Romans chapter 3. Uh, let's, let's read. Let's start in verse 21. But now apart from the law, that is without the law, even before the law came in, as Paul is going to teach in Romans 4, Abraham was justified by faith. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed in the law and the prophets. Right there in Genesis, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 14, 15, 17, and 22. Even the righteousness, verse 22, of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is, we fall short of his standard of perfection. But then the very next verse, verse 24, one of the greatest verses in the Bible, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. What does it mean to be uh, justified? It means that God declares us righteous in his sight, not because of what we've done, but because of who we are unified with, because of who we are related to. That is because of Jesus Christ. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Propitiation is an extremely important word in the New Testament. It only appears about four or five times, and it mean, it's, it has a twofold meaning to it. On the one hand, a propitiation means to receive the wrath of God, to receive the wrath of God. But Jesus, because he's sinless, can receive the wrath of God and turn that wrath into favor for us. So whereas we were formerly his enemies, now we are sons and daughters in Christ Jesus, uh, sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father, through Christ Jesus. That's what propitiation is. It means that Jesus becomes our substitute. He takes the wrath of God upon himself, but because of his sinless life, he's raised from the dead, and then he raises us from spiritual dead, gives us brand new life, and turns God's wrath against us into God's favor for us, and moves us from enemies and children of wrath to becoming children of God, sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. Can you give God a shout of praise again? Clap your hands, give him a shout, dance, break into song, thank him for what he's done, and rejoice in the free gift of salvation that was given to us. Praise the Lord. Let's continue on. Uh, let's continue on with our study in Exodus. So Jesus is our ultimate substitutionary sacrifice who gave his life once for all and never needs to repeat his sacrifice for us. That's why the new covenant is superior to the old covenant. <coughs> the old covenant required daily sacrifice. Jesus was sacrificed once and for all. He will never Supper on the cross again. Now the laver demonstrated that purification of sin is needed to access, <coughs> excuse me, God's presence. But again, such pur purification had to be done repeatedly because there wasn't yet a permanent sacrifice to cleanse the dead conscience of the worshiper. My friends, this stands in great contrast to Jesus, O Paki Yesu, who is our purification. 
and by whose innocent blood we have continual access to the Father without having to go through the ritual of cleansing. Aren't you glad that you can do that? We can live in the presence of the Father 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because Jesus has already provided the way. Amen? Now, hold on. The menorah, the seven, the seven, uh, the, uh, the candlestick in the tabernacle, this is what it looked like. Let me hold it up a little bit closer there. The menorah. This is um, uh, the candlestick in the tabernacle that provided light for the priest to be able to minister. It was dark. Of course, Jesus, as the greater tabernacle, came to dwell in us permanently, and we in him. He now provides all who follow him with his light. We read that in John 1. He was the light of men. And in John 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. A direct claim to deity. The showbread of the tabernacle was provided only for the priests. But Jesus' body is given as the bread of life for the world. I am the bread of life, he tells us in John 6, 35 and 48. Moreover, Jesus has made all who believe in him priests to his God and Father. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, and uh, Revelation 5, 10, Revelation uh, 20, verses 1 through 6. The incense symbolized the prayers of the priests on behalf of the people. But Jesus, our high priest, is continually interceding for us right this very second. And we find that in John 17, 9 and Hebrews 7, 25. And we also, by the way, let's not leave out God the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us uh, according to the perfect will of the Father, Romans chapter 8 and uh, verse 26. Romans 8, verse 26. So in Jesus, all the prayers of his people rise as incense before God. Romans are Revelation 8, 3. Your prayers and my prayers, when they're sincere and when they're offered in faith, rise as a sweet-smelling incense before God. The veil separated men from God, with the exception of the high priest, who is permitted to go behind the veil into the Holy of Holies once per year. But as I mentioned earlier, Jesus tore that veil in his resurrection, and in him the veil has been removed permanently. Wide open access from the sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father into his presence, the throne of grace forever and ever and ever. And there is just one aspect, loved ones, of the Father heart of God for you. He is not like Ramogi, who is vindictive and harsh and distant and 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 just like all the other gods and goddesses uh, throughout uh, humanity our father is loving and he draws us into his presence praise the lord opak ruth opaki yesu buona sefiwe amen uh, so he gives us wide open access to him the mercy seat the mercy seat showed that only blood could make atonement for sins. Remember, atonement is, uh, the Hebrew word is kippur, kippur. Um, let me write this down. Kippur, K-I-P-P-U-R. We have something, the Jews have something called Yom Kippur, which Yom is day, Kippur is covering, or Day of Atonement. That's the one day uh, 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 throughout the year where the sins of the nation, uh, the sins of the nation are atoned for through the Lamb, the sacrifice 
of the Lamb. Jesus is our Kippur. He is our covering. He is our atonement who washes us clean from our sin. Jesus is our mercy seat. So again, the mercy seat showed that only blood could make atonement for our sins, but that it had to be continually offered and sprinkled to cover for our sins. Now, Jesus is our propitiation. There's that word again. Um, he is our mercy seat. When, when we repent of our sins, God looks at what Jesus has already done, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. His blood covers our sin forevermore. It cleanses our conscience daily. His blood is so powerful that it covers God's wrath against us and turns that wrath into his favor for us, who are now his sons and daughters. And again, that's the definition of propitiation. Wow, are we blessed or what? Nyesai bear, Nyesai Duong, amen. God is good. God is great. The tabernacle was an identification of God's presence for Israel. Exodus 40, verse 34. It was an illustration of his plan for salvation for the world. Hebrews 9, verses 9 through 11. It was an incarnation of God, the Son, for his people. John 1, 14. We already went over that. And it was a prefiguration of the pattern of God's dwelling in heaven. Hebrews 9, 23 and 24, Revelation 4 and 5. There's a tabernacle in heaven. And the tabernacle on earth was only to be a model of the tabernacle in heaven. Friends, the Egyptians worshipped in many temples because they had many gods. Significantly, Israel had only one sanctuary. Why? You know, because there's only one God. They worshiped one God. A very important part of religion in Israel was the priesthood. For orderly ministration and effective worship, God designated Aaron, Moses' brother, to serve as high priest during Israel's journey through the wilderness. The Levites assisted the priests and they were chosen as substitutes for the eldest son in each family. Thus, the entire nation was represented in priestly ministry. The primary responsibility of the priest was to mediate between God and man through the offering uh, uh, of sacrifices for sin for their atonement. You see that in Exodus 28. Aren't you glad that you don't have to be involved in sacrificing animals on behalf of others. Thank God that priestly ministration is over with. Again, the superiority of the new covenant is obvious because Jesus is our high priest. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, and because he has made us priests to his God and Father. And so the result of this, loved ones, is that we ought to gain great appreciation, greater appreciation for our faith as we see how the Old Testament was preparatory for the New Testament and how through Jesus, our status before God is greatly exalted compared to our former, former status, Romans 5, uh, 8 through 10, where we were his enemies, and in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, where we were children of wrath. However, without a good understanding of the Old Testament, it is impossible for us to appreciate our exalted status. Isn't that true? Just like when we are forgiven of sin, when we understand the definition of sin, as we went over uh, last time, the, the, the threefold definition of iniquity, avon, of uh, transgression, which is um, uh, pesha, and then of sins, chata, uh, the seriousness of those sins. We understand what we're forgiven of, then we love more and we reverence more, at least we ought to. 
So the priests were also responsible to discern the will of God for the people. We find that in Numbers and Deuteronomy. However, under the New Covenant, all believers know God directly. John 6, 45. Accordingly, they and we can and must pray for discernment for ourselves and for other believers and expect God to reveal his will to us. One of my favorite prayers uh, that Paul prays for the believers in Philippi is in Philippians 1, 9 through 11. I'm going to pray that now uh, for myself and for you, and I urge you to pray it for yourself and for others. 